Welcome to another Megan Spotlight episode, to which we have invited our wonderful colleagues at Megan. Let's welcome from the team, Lowry Parkonen and Rasmus Detta. Lowry is our senior clinical application scientist, and Rasmus is our technology development engineer. Lowry and Rasmus are joining us during our spotlight today to provide some insights into optically pumped magnetometer, or OPM, an emerging technology in the field. Lowry and Rasmus, can you tell our listeners a bit more about your backgrounds and experience in this field? Oh, hello to all. I'm Lauri Parkkonen, professor at Alta University, but also a part-time employee at Megin. Uh, I've been with the company and with MEG since early 1990s, uh, developing the product and training customers. Yeah, hello, I'm Rasmus Setta. I recently finished my PhD working in Lauri's research group at Alta University. Uh, during it, that time, I worked specifically on OPM-based MEG system development. Uh, now moved to Megan, where I worked as a work as a technology development engineer. As OPMs are currently a relatively new topic in the MEG world, please explain to our audience what OPM technology is. How does it differ from conventional squid-based MEG? Lowry, maybe you want to start? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so let's look at the. Uh, working principle of the of the OPM sensor first. So it's based on quantum optics and the uh, the idea is that we we shine laser light at an appropriate wavelength through um, vapor, alkali metal vapor typically, uh, and then detect how much of that laser light passes through the vapor. And uh, uh, the amount of light depends on the applied magnetic field. So that's roughly the uh, the operating principle. And now the good thing with these sensors is that they can be made fairly small. As you can see in the figure, it's just uh, the size of two suka cubes or so. And uh, uh, the other nice thing is that these sensors do not require cryogenics. So cooling to very low temperatures as the conventional squid sensors used in MEG uh, need to be cooled. And uh, now in this figure, you can see how far the squid sensors are from the brain. In a, in a typical MEG measurement of an adult. So the distance is something like four and a half centimeters. And now if we could put the, the uh, MEG sensors right on the scalp, so then this distance from the sensors to the brain surface would drop to about uh, one half or even a little less. And now OPM sensors uh, can be placed in such a way because they don't need to be cooled as I mentioned earlier. And, and therefore, uh, they are closer to the brain. Now we can compare uh, squibs and, and OPMs. Uh, so this chart here, or list here, shows uh, some of the uh, sort of figures of merit um, of squids and, and current OPMs. So the noise level, uh, that's still uh, quite a bit better on squids. Um, so two to three femtoteslas per square root of hertz. Um, and uh, with OPMs, then it's maybe three times uh, higher, so uh, three times worse. The bandwidth, so which frequencies the sensor can pick up. So uh, with squids, we don't really have a, um, a limit in practice. With OPMs, we are limited to about 150 hertz, at least at the moment. Um, also, the tolerance to uh, large magnetic fields is quite different. Squids can tolerate uh, larger changes. OPMs also record absolute magnetic field levels, uh, not just the changes as squids do. And then what I mentioned, so the temp operating temperature is very different. Uh, squids need really to be cooled to a few degrees above the absolute zero temperature, whereas OPMs are internally heated up to about 150 degrees of centigrade, but the outer surface, of course, has to remain at the, the body temperature. Uh, the big difference is that squids, uh, squid array is rigid uh, because of this cryogenics whereas an OPM array can be adapted to the uh, head size and, and shape. So can you offer some insights into, into the different use cases for OPMs and squid-based MEG? Rasmus, maybe you go first. Yeah, sure. So as Laura mentioned, um, so with OPMs, the, the, the sensor array in the helmet doesn't have to be a rigid one-size-fits-all. So for, ex for example, OPMs might be better suited for infant measurements, measurements or children um, since you can adapt the array to the individual head, be it small or large. And somewhat related is that you can do so-called wearable MG, 
where the subject can move with the, the sensor array attached to their head uh, somewhat freely. Uh, there's some caveats related to sensor calibration here, but it's, it's, it's still something you can do, uh, which you can't with squids typically. And then on the other hand, if we think about uh, where squids excel, um, so it's of course robust technology. So for clinical applications where the measurement really has to be a reliable one, so so squids are, are doing better there. And also this sensitivity difference uh, that I mentioned earlier, um, even though OPMs are closer and therefore the signals are larger, as, as you can see in the, in the figure here, and so we, we get something like a threefold increase in the signal amplitude, but because of the uh, 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 threefold verse um, sensitivity, uh, so the higher noise level of OPMs, so the signal to noise ratio um, is about the same for, um, or it can be slightly better for OPMs, for those uh, sources in the brain that are fairly superficial. But then when you go deeper in the brain, when the source is deeper in the brain, so then uh, the benefit of the proximity of OPMs um, vanishes and, and then the squids yield a better signal to noise ratio. This is illustrated in, in, in this slide here. So you can see that actually most of the cortical surface is such that uh, the squids uh, still provide um, higher signal to noise ratio. Um, and so this means that for those kind of applications where the sources can be deeper in the brain, uh, so then a squid system um, will do a better job than an OPM system. Um, so there are definitely separate um, use cases for both kinds of uh, arrays. How is OPM-based MEG currently being used, and what do you think the future holds for this technology? Right, yeah, so first of all, current OPM-based MEG is, is limited to research use, and specifically research use that is performed by researchers that are more, let's say, technology-focused rather than only being neuroscience-focused. Um, and at, at the moment, we're seeing the first whole-head OPM-based uh, MEG systems develop. And in the future, the OPM technology itself may develop towards enabling more compact MEG systems, um, perhaps with low channel count and, low si and small size. And these might be for specific clinical applications. Uh, and then there's a different path way leading to applications requiring high spatial re resolution that you kind of get more than we would with typical uh, MEG systems at this time. But this is something that's yet to be demonstrated and, and, and looking forward to seeing the future. Uh, thank you both, Lowry and Rasmus, for your time today. This has been extremely informative for our audience. We're so pleased to be able to share your insights into OPMs and MEG, as you both have such extensive exp expertise in the field. Uh, thanks again for your time and uh, support. Thank you. Thank you.